Good evening or morning, everyone. Yes, broadcast video appears to be live, uh, but of course I can't test it right now. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the ostensible goal of this uh, session is uh, understanding coupling and cohesion, and so I've asked uh, a bunch of my uh, learned and esteemed colleagues if they would weigh in on their ideas about how they understand and how they teach uh, coupling and cohesion. Um, I, I think we'll dispense with the mechanical uh, sounding uh, introductions, except that I'll just say that uh, these are all people whose work I admire and respect, and I hope that uh, this is really going to turn into a fantastic conversation. And we even have Ron Jeffries now. Welcome. Woo! Hey, Ron. That was harder than, that was harder than I needed. I, my default viewer is uh, Safari. Ah, interesting. Well, that's that's you've that's a lesson learned right there. So uh, don't worry, Ron. All you've missed was the uh, the droning on uh, introduction, and um, everyone is here. So I uh, I'd like us to just get started. So uh, just looking at uh, people from left to right on my screen, uh, I'd like uh, if you just spend I don't know a few seconds, maybe not a few minutes, but a few seconds, um, just giving us sort of your i your your Actually, I'm curious to know, how long do you think it took before once you started thinking about coupling and cohesion before you thought you started to understand it? I know for me it was probably several years. Uh, Corey, what would you say? I think a lot of what I say around like TDD and learning that stuff is I, I think I got an understanding of it after about six months of thinking about it, and then another year, and then another year, and then another uh, year, uh, and uh, now, like, I remember last year having an interest, some interesting thoughts around messaging as a way of enforcing sort of the less cohesion in between my parts when I started learning about Erlang. And so I don't, I don't know if there was a time when I really felt like I really understand it as much as, like, it's an ongoing... Uh, Discovery mechanism or discovery around it. Excellent. All right, Curtis, what uh, what would you say? Um, well, I would have to say I'm I'm still trying to comprehend it. Um, I've been thinking about it for I, I I guess I don't spend enough time thinking about coupling and cohesion. Um, I try to teach when I coach. I just try to focus on TDD and try to keep people making small objects and you know keeping the cohesion. High. <laughs> so right, that's the direction we wanted, right? You want that high? The, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm still trying to grasp it. I'm still trying to teach it. I haven't grasped it well enough to teach it well. I, I'm afraid. <laughs> but fortunately, there's a lot of people here who have tried to help me, so that's cool. <laughs> Excellent. So, Dale, how would you uh, how would you respond to that question? Uh, I I don't think about coupling and cohesion directly um, I think about the things that contribute to it and the effects of it and I sort of fiddle on those and uh, I mean I, I do think about it from time to time but I don't find that the most helpful way to deal with it. Um, hmm. I looked, looked them up in the dictionary the other day, looked up the roots of them and I found this instructive in a way that I don't know if it'll be helpful for anyone but me but to couple means to fasten together and to cohere means to stick together. And I found that really interesting. It seems to me that the difference is whether the, whether the forces that bind the things are inherent in the things themselves or imposed externally. So. Yeah, I remember, uh, I actually remember reading something about the difference between uh, uh, cohesion and adhesion. And I'm going to see if I can find that uh, article so that I can uh, post it to the rest of the group because I think it's actually similar to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. about the difference between fastening things together and, and, and just putting things together. I don't remember even. Or there's some know. force in them that's holding them, the, in the things that's holding them together. Ah, okay. I, I think uh, Glenn Vanderberg has a post on that maybe about two years ago. Okay. That might be the one that I'm thinking of, Jim. Absolutely. So, uh, Jim, uh, how how would you answer that question? No, I would I would say years. My my understanding of coupling and cohesion, I think, has grown, particularly on um, based upon particular literature I've read. I think the the first book I read on that was the structured design books. This is way before OO 
was even a, a, a big thing that I was aware of. And, and it talked about this, tried to categorize cohesion and coupling into seven different layers and, and describe that. But I think the best understanding I've reached of that is in a book by Mueller Page Jones um, where he talks about this concept called um, connaissance. And essentially defines connaissance as if you have two things that are changing. If this thing changes and it forces a change in this other thing, then there is a connection between those two. And then he tries to categorize the different ways that uh, those changes can occur by through, through a name, through an implicit position in a list, through, uh, through types. And he has about nine or so different ways of those changes can be forced from one module to another. And I think that's a really awesome way uh, to describe the, at least the idea of coupling. Yeah, I, I actually hadn't heard about the, the Kinesin stuff before. I took a very quick read, and I'm, I'll make sure to ask you to give us a couple of references so I can uh, post them afterwards, or you can post them yourself. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think this is, this is a, an idea that I'd like to, to understand a little bit more about. Uh, Kent, so how, uh, how, how, how would you respond? Uh, I just calculated, and my answer is 31 years. Not bad. Because I had I had this book which Jim just mentioned as yes, yes. A, a, as a text and as you can see I'm still reading it right. um, and still trying to understand it uh, so uh, my understanding certainly uh, evolved a lot recently um, I, I have explanations for parts of coupling and cohesion that I don't think I had explanations well I know that I didn't have coherent explanations for uh, a few years ago. So I, I feel like I'm making progress, but I still uh, am very far from uh, like getting it as a whole. Nat? Um, I find, I think, probably more about coupling than cohesion, um, and I keep discovering new forms of coupling all the time. Um, I've I'm currently working on a very large project and I'm seeing the effect of Conway's law on design and how software uh, couples organizations together in ways they don't expect and organizations couple software uh, in ways uh, that they don't expect and all the problems that come from that. And I think there's essentially a very human aspect to it that, you know, I think there's a lot of theory uh, you can represent these things in terms of graph models and whatnot, but I think you know it comes down to a lot of how people think and how people understand, and so a lot of um, in terms of cohesion, I've been playing around with uh, trying to understand the natural language in code and trying to uh, do sort of uh, latent semantic indexing and things like that to try and understand uh, how cohesive uh, is the language in a piece of. Of, of code and see if that applies in any way to coherent uh, cohesion. Uh, so, yeah, uh, still learning and experimenting all the time. And last but by no means least, uh, Ron, how, uh, how would you respond? Well, I too began to learn about this uh, from Larry Constantine's book, and there was another book at the same time, I think by Myers, that talked about structured programming and the like. And um, I, it, I don't know that I would ever say that I understand anything, and so I'm not going to claim to understand this, but um, what I find important now to me is uh, Kent's rules of simple design, because to me, when I see duplication, that says to me there's an idea that is spread all over this code, and that's the sort of the opposite of cohesion. Um, and when I see uh, code that doesn't express ideas that says to me that there's something in here that needs to be figured out, needs to have a place to be and a place to exist. And so I find those rules lead me in the direction of what I sort of understand coupling and cohesion to be about um, without doing all the temporal coupling and, you know, accidental coupling and all those different, all those different words that uh, Larry tried to teach us. So I, I would say, yes, that one thing that I think I've noticed, and, I, and I, it would be nicer if there were a more direct one-to-one -one correspondence, but I think that, um, you know, going back to the, to the, the elements of simple design, um, 
that I do notice that there's quite a connection between, you know, on the one hand, thinking about just removing duplication and improving clarity, or improving names, and coupling and cohesion. And I wish it were as simple as, you know, uh, removing duplications strongly related to coupling and improving names is strongly related to cohesion. I think it's a little bit more, you know, it's not quite as neat as all that, but it seems to me the mapping between those sort of two pairs of ideas is, uh, is pretty strong. Um, now, one thing that I'd like to do is to find out uh, what you guys think about one of the ways that I like to try to teach uh, these concepts uh, in my TDD training. And the one thing that I, one of the things I like to tell people is that uh, coupling has a huge effect on how easy it is to change code once we realize we want or need to change it, whereas cohesion has a strong relationship to how easily we can figure out where we need to change it. That essentially high cohesion makes it easier to figure out which parts of the code to change, and low coupling makes it safer to change the parts of the code once we find it. Um, has anyone hit upon something similar? Do I sound completely nuts? Any comments? We'll just kind of throw it out and see what people have to say. Well, I think that um, I think high cohesion definitely limits the scope of the change. Okay. You know? yeah. yeah, I think that the cohesion, it's not as much that it absolutely tells you where it needs to change, but those things change together. So it makes it simpler to change. It makes it safer to change because you're going to be changing these things. And you can just kind of read it and know. But I do like the coupling part. All, all of a sudden I'm wondering if cohesion and coupling are the same thing but just at different localities. If you have a single module, those things in that module are very tightly related to each other. They are highly, well, they have, have I would say, have a high connaissance with each other, or they're tightly coupled together. There's coupling within that small module, but you, but that makes that module cohesive in that way. Is is cohesion just putting the coupling together in one place and making it visible, perhaps, perhaps, uh, and explicit? Mm -hmm. so, so some of the trickiest coupling is where it's not visible, it's not actually in the code, it's just in accidental uh, interactions between different pieces of code that, that don't have a relationship in the text itself. For me, I think uh, coupling has a lot to do with how many places have to change, and cohesion has to do with how easy it is to find them and whether they're where I look for them. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, Dale, that's that's you know both Jim's idea that coupling and cohesion might be just much more strongly related ideas to each other than we think. Um, I sometimes have trouble uh, sort of distinguishing cohesion from coupling, precisely because, on the one hand, cohesion makes it easier to figure out where things are because once I find one, I found them all. I found as soon as I find something that needs to change, there's a good chance that I've found all the things that need to change. But then coupling certainly determines whether those changes ripple out throughout the rest of the system. And so in a way it almost, seem, it, it almost seems like high cohesion and low coupling, uh, or that, that it's almost impossible to have, say, uh, low cohesion but low coupling and high cohesion but high coupling. Uh, it seems to me that High cohesion and high coupling is okay as long as the the, the, the part of the structure we're looking at is relatively small. So if cohesion high, and coupling are coupled and cohesive? It it certainly might be. Uh, I I don't know. I mean that's part of what that that's part of what makes this topic interesting to me is that I, I every time I think I have found a relatively succinct way of trying to explain some important part of it, uh, it doesn't quite work. The explanation helps, but it doesn't quite work. Mm. It seems to me that um, if you think about high cohesion and high coupling occurring someplace, that that brings you to the other simplicity rule, which is to minimize programming entities. Um, if we have a program with a bunch of highly cohesive objects, every single one of which talks to every other single one of which, um, that's 
not as good as if only that each one only talked to two or each one only talked to one in a big circle. Um, so I think that the that the reduction of coupling is one of the one of the things that you reduce um, entities in, in Kent's uh, gift to us. And I think a, a lot of when you talk about the reducing entities, a lot of times people forget that, in, at least in my view, the messaging between the entities is part of the thing you want to minimize. So having every component talk to every other component, that's this huge, massive graph of communication. And minimizing that is really an important part. And I tend to look at the fourth rule as really focused on that because I know JB and I have talked about this, that if you really tightly do the reveal intent and no duplication, you end up with a very small set of entities if you continue to minimize the amount of messaging between them and the amount of communication between them. Yeah, it seems to me if you have high cohesion and high coupling, then that has to be pretty strongly localized. It, it, you, you can't have high cohesion and high coupling with 118 design elements. I mean, that's going to be a small number. It's going to be 10 or 12, in which case, you know, you slap a facade on that sucker, extract an interface, and 99% of the world doesn't need to know that you have this relatively small tangle. Um, and a relatively small tangle doesn't, I don't think, create much of a problem for anyone, really, does it? Well, that's, that's the, the definition in structured design, that cohesion is coupling within an element. Mm. So, so if I have a class, and if I change one uh, method in the class, I have to change the other. Say I've got a, 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 I'm reading some file format, and if I change the way I read it, I have to also change the way I write it. Then those those two functions are coupled, exactly coupled. But the class that they're con that that encloses them both is cohesive. And I don't think you can have high cohesion and high coupling at the same time. Not at, any, not at any given level. Right. <laughs> okay. Hi, Corey. Hi. Um, I like that at that level because it's, it's really kind of what Nat was saying, too, is that there's this, there's this language in your system and there's this story that's being told at the different levels. And so if you look at it at a very small, like, method level, there's a story in that method. And then if you expand out to the class, there is a potentially a different story. It sort of encapsulates that sub-story. And looking at it at your entire system, that kind of drives out a lot of what, what should be coupled, what should be cohesive. Because if you can't like read it and know what's going on and it's just some crazy choose-your-own-adventure, then there's probably, there, there could be something wrong with your design. Um, so how does that connect us then to composed method? which is a method that basically tells a story. I didn't raise my hand to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Ron, t uh, tell us a little bit more about what you mean. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, if, if you either think, here's yet another thing I learned from Kent, if you either think about programming by intention where you basically say, well, first I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do this third thing, and then you go back and implement that, and this, and the third thing. Um, or if you refactor a method that's got a blob of code that you read for an hour and then suddenly looked at it and said, oh, I see what he's doing here, and gave that a name, you get the composed method pattern, which is that a method really tells a story. It either does a thing or it tells a little story. And I wonder if that isn't talking about the coupling within that class, because this particular method couples together um, all of these typically more atomic methods. So it seems to me there's a connection there, and I asked it as a question because I don't really know. I, th I think that would be a way, I mean, the coupling within that method would show you how cohesive the class is, especially looking at the language of it. If, if I've got something that's intermingling, reading files, parsing XML, and uh, you know, calculating a sales invoice. It's not a very cohesive thing, even though the pieces are coupled. 
uh, inside that class. So that would give me some indication where I might want to break things out and introduce some messaging uh, to, to sort of decouple the parts. I'll go, Kent. Uh, so, uh, Nat, I, I think you're using coupling in a sense that's a little different than how I use it, which is, I mean very specifically, if I change this part, I have to change that part also. So, uh, in fact, with the composed method example where I've got this, you know, the method just says input, process, output, if I change, uh, say, input and output, I'm not going to have to change the the composing method, the method that tells the story, but because I can change the details. So that actually reduces the cohesion because those aren't coupled together. I can change the parts without having to change this thing that that talks about the whole. But I, I don't see that as a as a a big problem. I think that's we're always managing cohesion up and down. It's a resource that you use, and as long as you don't have too much of it or it doesn't get out of control, then you're okay. Yeah, I guess in terms of uh, coupling or loose coupling, I also think of it as, as can I use this program element independently of where I'm currently using it? So in a composed method, the the call in the middle of that composed method out to another method of the class to me would, is is coupled in because I can't go, ah, oh, well that I could use as an independent piece to build something else in another part of my program. So I would, if, if I, I could see that it was not cohesive or the language wasn't coherent, then I would be thinking, well really I should be breaking these apart because they are different things. That, mm -hmm. So maybe that's a different a whole, you know, maybe that's a different design thing and not exactly coupling. Yeah, so it seems to me that the that you know, uh, getting back to the notion that coupling and cohesion are are uh, somehow almost like the same thing at different levels. It seems to me that or at least the way I understand the terms, cohesion has more to do with the likelihood that I would want to reuse or change things together or not. Whereas coupling more has to do with, uh, in order to actually change the behavior of this thing, am I forced to also make code changes in that thing and that thing and that thing? And so cohesion to me seems to be more about uh, the likelihood that I would want to reuse things together or not, whereas coupling has to do with the likelihood that changing one forces me to change the other. Ron? I would... I would not disagree, but I would set up some counterpoint. To me, cohesion is all of these ideas belong together. And coupling is about how I connect together these atomic ideas to make something. And I think that's a little different from what you were saying. I'm not sure. I'm not either. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that... that Cohesiveness seems to me to be more about um, appropriateness of reuse together or not, whereas coupling is about um, uh, coupling is really just about direct code level dependencies. I have a reference to that, that thing, and therefore if that thing changes, I might have to change. And because I have a reference to that thing as a concrete class instead of a nice abstraction, the likelihood is higher that if somebody changes that thing, I'll have to change. But coupling can happen even without direct references, too, and I think this is something that surprises people. I can have two different modules that have no direct relationship to each other, but because, uh, for example, a, a checksum algorithm, uh, you know, the server has the, generates a checksum, the client uh, calculate, you know, checks the checksum. The algorithms have to agree. If I change the algorithm on one side, the other algorithm has to do. There's no direct use between them. There's no. They may be entirely different languages on different systems, uh, but still, they are coupled together. There's a. Uh, we would call that connaissance of algorithm in connaissance terms. 
Yes, and so that certainly sounds like a case that's about coupling but not cohesion. And the difference is that the coupling is the the coupling is not relying on global data. It's actually relying on ideas in the heads of the people who are putting those two systems together. These which, two software elements have to agree, and if they don't right. agree on the algorithm or on the numbers they use or on, or on anything, uh, you know, they they have a connection, even though it's very ephemeral. Right. And those are the kind of connections we miss sometimes when we're looking at things. They are, and the reason we miss them is because we have violated the rule about expressing all ideas. Because in our head we had the idea, these two things have to agree, and there's, by your definition, no place where the code says that. Mm -hmm. Thus that fact is only in the heads of old guys who are going to retire soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think um, so. Go ahead, please. No, I think what we're talking about here is a protocol, and uh, that I think is, I, I often think about my designs in terms of protocols between the parts, um, and you know, we can't always follow once and only once when we have multiple organizations, many of whom never speak to each other, trying to connect things into a, uh, into a system, and yet we, you know, looking at the web, we see that works reasonably well-ish. Um, so there is a place where people define these things. It just doesn't have to be implemented in one place. And so we, we get these hidden couplings. don't know where I'm going with that. Um, the one thing that I was struck by was what Ron said about coupling was that um, it was not a negative description of coupling. So, so far in this discussion, we've kind of assumed that coupling is bad. Um, but Ron's description of it was also a positive thing, right? Um, and I think that, in general, people say oh, coupling bad and cohesion good, but it's not not always you know the case. We always have to have some way of connecting things together, which causes some coupling. Um, and maybe I don't know. Back to protocols, protocols again. We need to make that explicit. And anyway, I sorry, yeah. Corey. Corey. Well, I think going on that, it's that idea that. Coupling is most likely necessary, and so it's figuring out what you're coupling on. Are those reasonable ways to couple your two systems together? Are they something that you can swap out? Is it something that is standardized? So doing a checksum, you probably can say, this is a pretty safe way to couple my two systems together because we can publish what it is and all of that, um, as opposed to hard binary referencing between two components. And it, it's a couple times I've been come into my mind this, I forget exact phrasing of it, but this idea of sort of the package of, of deployment needs to be the package of reuse. And so those are these how things cohere together. And if it really is a checksum, and it can be published about what that is, algorithm is, then it's OK for them to be coupled along with like Jim talks about the different levels of connaissance and these ones are very very strong these ones are very weak and you want to move towards the weak ones mm -hmm. but it's an is it an inevitable fact of life that we're going to have coupling between things right and, and as you know to, to Nat's specific point it, I whenever I talk about coupling and cohesion with other people if, especially if I'm you know teaching uh, I try very hard to make sure everybody knows that uh, uh, a system with zero coupling does absolutely nothing. I mean, you just end up with <laughs> yes. you just end up with a bunch of islands that do absolutely nothing. And so, coupling, as you say, Corey, is necessary for the system to do anything at all. Where we get into trouble is is in excessive coupling. It's coupling beyond the minimum it takes to get the system to do something we want. And so, you know it. it Yes, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking coupling bad, but really what we mean is force all coupling to justify itself. And if you can't, if you can't point, if you point to a relationship between two modules, um, and you can't justify every, uh, you can't justify some aspect of that relationship, that the dependency, then you have to suspect it, and you need to get rid of it. And as Ron says, the law of Demeter is one of the one of the uh, specific examples of this, right? That if you can't justify the 
having to know about all the intermediaries between you and the thing you actually want to talk to, then you got to get rid of that somehow. It 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 becomes a uh, it becomes something that we do need to uh, to it it becomes something that we can never eliminate, but we should probably view with suspicion much more often than we don't. Uh, there were a, there were some questions out there, so I'll gather those together uh, between Kent, Dale, and Curtis. You guys can fight for who will speak next. I can go. I I just want to be sure. Um, I don't think coupling itself is bad, but we talk about you know we want things to be loosely coupled, and I don't. Rather than talk about coupling, I'd like to talk about what do we mean oh, wow. by loosely coupled? Is it the number of objects you're coupled to? Is the is it the abstractness of the objects you're coupled to? What what do we mean by loose coupling? Because that seems to be what we favor. Ken? Uh, I have a very specific uh, definition, which is uh, two elements are loosely coupled if they never show up in the same diff. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I I like to talk about both, both the number of things that you talk to and the... Um, the strength of that connection. Right. And so, you know, generally speaking, being connected to abstract things tends to be, tends to be loose, more loose, uh, looser coupling than uh, connecting to the concrete implementation. Although, as, you know, Jim talked about with his example of the two separate software systems, that doesn't mean that depending on a protocol means that you've got rid of coupling entirely or made it weak. I like to speak of of strength and locality and degree. Um, there's there's different kinds of coupling, and I like to rate them according to their strength. Um, like connaissance of name, you know, where things are related by name. That's that's probably one of the weaker forms of coupling, where coupling by our connaissance of position, where you have to agree on the positions of things in like an array. That's a really strong type of coupling. So. If you're looking at two different ways of doing it, preferring name over position type of coupling is a good thing. Also, degree. How you know, if you're doing position, is it is it is it an ordered pair? Yeah, that's not so bad. Night items in a list? Yeah, that's a little worse. So so those are the two things I look at uh, when I'm looking at how loosely coupled something is. To me, the, go ahead. The when we're talking about whether coupling is is bad, to me the the goodness or badness of any particular coupling is determined by subsequent events. It's determined by whether these things have to change in the future. And so I think the more things change, the less we want them to be coupled. And I have this idea, and I don't know how to apply it, that if something is stable, we can potentially take advantage of that by coupling things or at least, at least that particular coupling becomes tolerable. Um, so t to me, coupling is, is, is the, the problem with it is that things change. And if, if we have an understanding of how things change, we can perhaps use that to our advantage to determine which things are OK to couple and which things are less OK. Of course, the trouble is we, we don't know ahead of time which things are going to change. Right. I always uh, just a sec, Nat. I always remember the thing that I heard from Ron, which is if I knew if I knew which mistakes I was going to make, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on a beach. I would have been long, rich, and retired, and I wouldn't be dealing with you crazy people anymore. Maybe so, you are on a beach. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite on a beach. The beach is outside, but yes. <laughs> uh, Nat, go ahead, and then uh, soon I'm going to have a question to ask the group. Cool. Okay. Uh, on the subject of loose coupling, I think there's uh, something to do with runtime, dynamic, late binding. Um, so you're more loosely coupled if you're coupled to an abstract interface because you can connect something to it at runtime or make a choice very late um, so that you can more easily change things. Related to what Dale was saying, that you know we statically couple ourselves to the standard library and the runtime of our languages to you know string types and what have you collections because they are very stable so we don't care so much that they are abstract and in our own domain modeling we prefer to you know use the dependency inversion principle to cut our coupling because we have much more flexibility coming from the 
the runtime late binding uh, you know, dynamic dispatch that we get. I think do I think we do sometimes forget when we can get away with coupling, and that the, when we can get away with with depending directly on something concrete, and that is that the stabler it is, the less danger we have of getting into trouble. Now the good news the good news is there's less danger of getting into trouble. The bad news is when trouble hits, it probably jabs us quite severely in the chest, uh, and so it becomes a high risk high reward kind of situation. But uh, on the other hand. You know, depending on an interface sounds good in principle, except that if I have to change something every time some little thing in that interface changes because we have a cohesion problem, we have related things in different places, uh, then, you know, the abstraction sounds good in principle but doesn't seem to work. Uh, and that's, to me, I actually would prefer a concrete hardwired dependency in that case because at least I know what I'm getting into. Whereas when things look loosely coupled, and it turns out they aren't. That I, I don't know about you, but that seems to be endemic in a lot of the legacy code I end up dealing with. But you know, this stuff shouldn't be coupled together, and yet somehow it is. Why am I always yes. changing these things? Yeah. <laughs> From the group uh, that is uh, somewhat related. Uh, does anyone on the panel have recommendations on automated mechanisms to track coupling and cohesion? For example, if you want to run an analysis on an existing code base, uh, I can answer quickly and say no. Uh, Ken? So, uh, because of exactly what Dale said, it's it's the things that actually change together that represent coupling, not the not. It's like potential energy and kinetic energy. Right. You can have potential coupling, but if you never change one side, then it doesn't matter. So I I, I stand by my definition that it's if you uh, if you show me the system, I can't tell you what's coupled. But if you show me the diffs that went into creating that system, I sure can. Anyone else? We played around with this uh, when we were working. I was working with uh, uh, Michael Feathers has been doing a lot of stuff on looking into the Git repository and doing mining there and we were looking at a lot of things around that sort of look over history as to what files change what you know do you have a commit where a file disappears and two appear and sort of seeing that from a time-based perspective looking at the history of your Git log and that that actually is a we had a, a couple tools and uh, Michael's been doing a lot of work on building more tools around that. Um, so that might be something to look at. I don't know if he's still calling it turbulence, but we were at the time. Um, in .NET, I used to use Independ, and it was actually really nice for sort of showing me graphically what the dependencies are. And if you can get them, if you can sort of cluster them, oftentimes they'll just, you know, problems can scream out at you when you have too many things in one place. Yeah. Michael, Fe Michael Feathers had a visualization uh, where he shows when a file was first created and when it was last edited uh, over time. So basically how many files at any one time are still open, as in have not had their last edit in the history yet. And from that you can see basically how much the code is churning, uh, how, how, how much it has been, um, I guess, modularized into cohesive pieces. Um, or how much of it is just in constant churn. And that's a really useful and, and very easy to do uh, visualization. Um, my worry of metrics though, is they become targets. And so I've been playing around with like just pulling out the identifiers of code, more to understand the cohesion than the coupling, um, pull out identifiers of various modules of the code, and then just turn them into a word cloud. So split the identifiers into actual words, throw them up into a word cloud, and then you can't say, oh, well, we want to have a cohesion metric of 94% this iteration. Instead, it's just, does that look right? This bit, of, this bit of our code should be about, you know, whatever the domain is. Do those words make us feel that it is about that domain? Or is it full of words like get, set, null, XML, TCP? you know, uh, if that's not your domain. Um, so I, I've put that up on GitHub. The URL is there in the sidebar. 
um, and it's just it, it's quite fun to play with, and you get some quite surprising results out of it if you stick it up on a screen and just every uh, you know build generate the word clouds and pop them up on screen. People get quite surprised by what their code actually looks like. The two things that I have the most trouble with when I'm coding are what to name things and where to put things. And I've come to the conclusion that they're the same problem in a way. Um, does each name represent everything I want to say about the named thing? And do the names that appear together evoke ideas that seem to go together? And, and that's all fluffy, but that's what's going on in my head all the time. And, and if, if I'm having trouble naming things, I often discover that the problem is that things are together that shouldn't be, or they aren't together that should be. And if I'm having trouble figuring out where things go, it's because there's something in the name that shouldn't be there, or something that isn't there that should be. And it's weird, but they end up sort of being the same problem. And I can solve one by fiddling with the other. And it's a lot like the idea that they tell a story because we've all, like, I just stopped reading a book in the middle because I couldn't keep track of what was going on. There would be a paragraph <laughs> and then another paragraph with new people and new names appearing. And I finally just, I will say throw the book down, but it was on my Kindle. So I, you know, aggressively hit the home button. And, and it was, and it's along the same lines. If you, if you look through a class and you start having to jump sort of the context levels and why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? Um, it can be a good indication that there's a problem there. Okay, I do have... Uh, let's Wait, Ron on. has his hand up. Oh, Ron, why do start speaking? Um, it's, it, this is making me think that there are... Uh, and we've talked about this before, there are good things and bad things about coupling and about cohesion. It says to me that visualizing coupling, for example, and cohesion, if you could do that, I can't imagine what a cohesion visualizer quite would look like. Um, if you look at the coupling, you will see things that are interesting, but I do not believe the numbers will be very helpful. There's more going to be that you see, oh, look, there's a master class and everybody's talking to it, and then you think, is that what I want or is that not what I want? And so I, uh, in a way, I, I, I like the more explicitly subjective rules like Kent's simplicity rules because they are about thinking. They're not about measuring. Yeah, I, 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 one of the ways that I try to describe um, cohesion to groups is, is to talk about the idea of the extent to which related things are close together and unrelated things are far apart. And so what we want is for, we generally would like related things to be closer together and unrelated things to be further apart. And so if you see two things that sound related, nudge them closer together. And if you see things that, uh, if, if something, whether it's removing duplication or improving names, is encouraging you to pull things apart, then ask yourself, how related are these things? Are, are they, do they seem so related that I should fight to keep them together, or should I let them go apart? And that, that seems to be a way for uh, it, it, it seems to help me in figuring out how to move code, and I haven't had anyone tell me that it's obviously stupid, so uh, it, it might sort of be moving somewhat in the right direction. <laughs> well, try again, Ron? That's the one I try to strive for as well, not obviously stupid. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, you know, it seems to me that, that that's what certification is about, right? It's trying to find things that are not obviously Ooh. stupid. Um, <laughs> That so uh, it's interesting you're talking about distance. You know, like there isn't really a distance in software. So I guess if I may interpret what what you mean, uh, and feel free to disagree, uh, is that you mean through local names? Like how many local name hops do I have to go through uh, before I get to a different concept? You know, so like from a a parameter to something, or through an instance variable to something through an interface and then behind that interface there's another set of another modeling domain uh, which is talking about something different. Um, is that kind of what you mean by distance? 
Yeah, I'd say that, that I hadn't thought about exactly how to say that because no one seems to ask me. But um, but yeah, I, I would think that, for example, uh, two things are far apart if either uh, I have to go through a bunch of hops, as you say, a bunch of messages in order to get something from one to the other, or if I need if I need to change them both, then how, like how hard do I have to look to figure out where the other one is? Right, so if I'm doing some shotgun surgery because I have a concept that's scattered throughout the code, um, you know, how many clicks does it take for me to find the next instance of something I need to, I need to change? And in fact, maybe the distance is infinite if I can't figure it out hmm. in time. So tooling, you know, seems to have some uh, input or effect on this because in in some IDEs, it, I can do a quick search and find all the words that happen to relate. And I don't care where anything is in a package or a directory because my ID just finds it like Google. Um, but if I'm working in C, it's a different matter. I have to be much more carefully organized uh, and know where things are and think much more about distance between modules and stuff. Right. So Dale mentions nearest common ancestor package uh, or module or namespace. And I think that probably, that probably fits pretty well, too, is how far up the chain do we have to go before we get, hit a common ancestor. Um, and, yeah, that... that that sounds like a, a good one to me. I was reading a blog post recently, I forget who wrote it, that was related to uh, uh, how easy it is to search in IDEs, and that may be masking problems. Hmm. That if it's easy to search for things, we don't have to think so hard about where to place things. And so we're, we're, we're hiding our um, uh, anti-cohesion from ourselves in a way. And But this might be where coupling kind of helps us, I suppose, because if uh, and this is, no, maybe not. I'm going to have to let that mull. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I think ahead, it is because people have, it took me a, a couple years of when I switched to Ruby from C Sharp to figure out why I was so incredibly comfortable in Visual Studio with C Sharp, but when I moved to Ruby, I you know, started with TextMate and then moved to Vim. And once I got past the I'm so awesome I use Vim, I realized that I didn't find myself needing the facilities that Visual Studio gave me. And it took me a little while to realize, and I thought that I, uh, my designs in Ruby are different because I don't have all those facilities. And it may be that, the, that those facilities have led me to those designs but I can't just hit a command and go to anywhere in my system. I have to have a little bit more understanding of where things are or how to get somewhere. And it does, you know, Ruby has a, a much different view on sort of the coupling than C Sharp does. And so that might have an influence from, the, from just what Dale was saying. Yeah, I, I, the, an idea just popped into my head, and it's actually related to uh, a question, a comment here from one of our, our followers about you know, um, it, it, coupling and cohesion, good, bad, maybe surprising. It's, uh, when when I you know say find me everyone using this particular function or this particular variable uh, or this particular class, um, yes, it can kind of hide a little bit the cohesion problems until I look at the search results and go, what the hell is that guy using this thing for? Or, you know, what, wh why did it match there? What, what is that guy over there doing using my stuff? And so I think that it's sort of the, it, it might mask the potential cohesion, but then as soon as you start looking at who's using this thing, if the search results are surprising, then maybe that's, a, maybe you've discovered, oh, here's a potential cohesion problem. And so the cohesion problem might be latent in the fact that I can just search for stuff instead of having to go hunt it down and find it. But as soon as I start searching for something in particular, I'll get this feeling like, no, that's not right. That thing over there shouldn't be using this thing. And so perhaps it's the surprise factor that, that has a lot to say about uh, whether, a particular bit, uh, whether a particular bit of code or uh, a collection of things are cohesive or not is sort of our surprise at thinking of them in the same breath. If I may mix metaphors with the Cuisinart there. Um, do you have, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how this question will go, but we'll see. 
Uh, if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only drive your software designs by thinking about coupling or cohesion, which would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it, with, with respect to our questioner, it sounds like a crazy question because the two seem to be so intertwined, but I'm curious to see what people think about it. Cohesion. I would very much say coupling because coupling, I think, would lead me to building and in very, 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 very tiny things and just sort of making them interchangeable and be able to reuse each other with no problems. And so the things wouldn't be coupled together at all, they, but they would just do one thing. And then I could couple them together in a bunch of different ways. I think Ron's exploding if we don't get him talking. I am, because <laughs> I would have said all the exact same words as you did, except I would have said I would think about cohesion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is funny. It makes me think about the question, what would you rather have? Uh, uh, beautiful code with no tests or crappy code with awesome tests? And I usually answer that question as, I would rather have crappy code with awesome tests because the tests will make it easier for me to make the code pretty. But if I don't have tests and I have to change even pretty code, pretty code isn't that pretty. I mean, it's not pretty everywhere. Uh, and with my luck, it'll, it'll be ugly in the place that I need to change right now. And so I'm kind of with Corey. I think that if I have to choose between coupling and cohesion, I want coupling because at least that makes it easier for me to put related stuff together and move unrelated stuff farther apart, whereas the, result, the, the, the opposite's not necessarily true. So I, but but if you're thinking about uh, putting related stuff together and moving unrelated <laughs> stuff far apart, you're already starting by thinking about cohesion, and that's more would be not my argument. I'd first think about cohesion because that's what it helps me understand what I'm doing and how I should be splitting things up, and then the coupling and decoupling falls out from that. I guess I always take for granted the idea that I'm going to understand what's going on. I, th I think I would like to, uh, if I were doing it, I would focus on cohesion and make sure my pair partner was focusing on coupling. <laughs> uh, Jim always takes the cheating answer. Nice. I, I, would, uh, I like cohesion because um, if I focus on cohesion, coupling gets better. Um, and, and one of the things that I have to do to increase cohesion is name things better. Whereas if I focus on coupling, the names don't have to get better. Um, so that's that's a big one for me. So if I could focus on only one, I would focus on conescence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Curtis? My first, my gut reaction was coupling, and then when I went to justify it in my head, I started using all the things that Ron said. <laughs> and I said, and then I, I'm like, but that's cohesion. I, and I don't, the more I think about the question, I don't know if you can just think about one. <laughs> Well, it makes it it, it, it it makes me kind of go back a little bit to the remove duplication and improve names uh, simplicity rules that uh, you could you could show examples of where you're focusing on removing duplication. You can show examples when you're focusing on improving names, but after like 20 minutes, you're removing duplication because it's patterns in the names, and then that you know moving code because you're removing duplication in the names then. It gives you a better idea of what this thing over here should be called, so then you name it something better. And now you've done that a few times, which now you see, oh, there's these four things that all have similar names. Let's remove the and it just the loop is just it doesn't take long before you get to the point where the two are feeding on each other. So I, I wonder whether it's it's not a question of which you'd rather do, but where would you rather start? Do you do you tend to think more in terms of coupling and then get sucked into thinking about cohesion? Or do you tend to think about cohesion and then get sucked into talking to thinking about coupling? Kent? So the, the argument from structured design, and it's I, I've worked with it for a while and I'm happy with it, is everything is potentially coupled to everything else. So you've got this huge n squared problem. And the nice thing about cohesion is because you're looking at smaller and smaller scopes, uh, I can I can uh, the, the the two tend to be inverse highly cohesive designs tend to be loosely coupled so if I focus on cohesion I can do that in a in a, a small scope and I don't have to be trying to think about 
the the larger scale but if I improve cohesion at a small scale I will tend to improve coupling at a large scale so that, that's their argument that's uh, Ed and Larry's argument for focusing on cohesion and not worrying about coupling so much but could you and, argue could you argue that by focusing on not on the, the having the minimum number of things coupled together at every level is sort of the opposite of focusing on having things together that remain together. So I'm I'm probably going to fall back on what always happens when I talk to Ron, which is the idea. I agree with my idea, but I just sort of didn't understand it well enough to name it well. So I do <laughs> think I think I actually am talking about cohesion, but looking at it from that point of view of coupling is sort of pushing everything away from each other and keeping things independent and you end up with naturally the things that are related together sticking together yeah. if that makes any I, sense I, th I think also that the world will tell me about coupling uh, it won't tell me so much about cohesion that as things change the you know that will tell me as things in the environment change that'll tell me about coupling so I can focus my energy on cohesion the world won't tell me so much about that. I would probably have a tendency to focus on coupling because it's probably easier to get two people to agree that things are absolutely or loosely coupled, whereas cohesion is uh, seems so much more of a subjective matter that uh, yes. it seems to lead to more arguments. Now it could be that those arguments are better arguments, but it, I suppose it depends on on how much energy I have that day. <laughs> Uh, so we're getting to the uh, we're getting to the top. Of the, in fact, we're at the top of the hour. Um, so I'm just wondering if if anyone has any parting thoughts, would like to get something out that uh, they haven't had a chance to say yet. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> All right. Well, I I don't know about you guys, but I have certainly enjoyed the conversation. And uh, so what I'd like to invite you guys all to do is any references that you have to articles, books, etc. that you want to share, um, please go back to the, uh, the, the Google Plus uh, event and post it so that people can see it or uh, wait for the YouTube video and post the comments there as well. Uh, and I would absolutely love to thank all my, uh, all my friends here for their willingness to spend an hour on an afternoon or morning and uh, talk about this. Uh, Ron Jeffries, Nat Price, Kent Beck, Jim Wyrick, uh, Dale Emery, Curtis Cooley, and Corey Haynes. I'm Jay Brains, and uh, I think we're out of here. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.